90 percent of, of medical issues that we treat in in the world are, as doctors are these non-commutable chronic diseases that don't exist if you don't eat plants they just don't exist if you get enough fatty meat and you don't eat plants these don't exist the vast majority of them don't exist you know that that's important and you know having people die of you know dementia and uh, cancer and autoimmunity and kids not developing properly and you know one in 22 uh, boys will have autism. One in thir 34 uh, people in general will have autism now, whereas one in 10,000 back in the 70s. I mean, that's not ethical. I mean, you, you cannot you cannot support a system that does that to people and destroys their bodies and brains like that. You just can't. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, another YouTube live, also uh, live on Facebook and X. Um, formerly known as Twitter. So uh, this is for the 2nd of April, uh, 2024 and uh, April 3rd here in Australia. So um, I had a couple uh, super chats last week that I, I uh, or last Thursday, Friday, um, unfortunately I had to cancel my live that morning, I had a, a last minute uh, issue come up that I had to go deal with. And so uh, a couple of the couple of the uh, people had already put up super chats uh, before the thing started. So um, I'm just going to start with those and um, and then go from there. So the first one is from uh, Beth, who uh, Beth R1220, who says, uh, Hi, Dr. Chafee. Thank you for answering these questions. I'm uh, starting the challenge on April 1st. Um, I have, so I'd be in the, the how to carnivore challenge that, that, uh, we run. I have a long history of severe yo-yo dieting and restriction. I'm currently a bit underweight and I have a massive appetite. I know, so I know that my hunger satiety cues are messed up. I think eating is almost uh, more mental than physical for me. So I know fatty meat will taste good as long as my, uh, long after my stomach is physically full. How do I handle it or cure this? Also, how critical for success is grass-fed meat? Where I live, Walmart is basically my only option, but I want to be sure I'm doing everything right. Thank you so much. Um, you know, if you're if you're a bit underweight, you know, and your body's telling you to eat more, it's probably for a good reason. I don't. It's probably not uh, that you're you're getting false signals or things you know, uh, and that you're being told to eat when you shouldn't. If you're not on medication like prednisone, prednisolone, hydrocortisone, those sorts of steroid hormones, then uh, you generally can listen to your hunger signals. And if you're, if you're underweight um, and your body is saying, please eat, then you should probably eat. It's probably a good idea to do that. Um, and, uh, and so I would just, I would just do that. I'd eat high fat meat and just keep eating until it stops tasting good. If you get physically full and your body just is saying, well, oh, that would still be good, but you're physically full. That's fine. Come back to it later. You don't have to just eat once a day. You know, if you're, if your body wants to put on weight, then you will likely have to eat more than once a day. So when I'm working out, I'm lifting weights a lot and my body wants to put on muscle. I have to eat more than once a day. It's just a, it's just a requirement. And so um, it's, uh, it's probably the same with, with you. Your body's telling you that it wants you to eat. And so just eat. You know, that's, uh, that's what your body's asking you to do. Um, there are people that are in that position, that they're, they're sort of underweight and their body wants to put on weight. And they eat a lot. Of, they, they eat more calories than I do. And, um, and they, they put on a lot of good, healthy weight. So I would, just, I would still do that. I would still just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good or until you're full and then try to eat, you know, uh, and eat more than once a day if you need to, you know, and if you do that a couple times a day and you're eating fatty enough food, typically you'll find that it, um, uh, that that's enough and that your body's very satisfied. If, um, if you need to eat three times a day, then eat three times a day, you're, you're going to hit a point where your body puts on a certain amount of healthy lean body mass. And maybe a bit of a uh, bit more uh, fat stores that that are healthy for you, and uh, and that point when your body gets to a steady state and a stable position, it's just going to say, okay, that that's it. That's where we want to stay, and your your appetite will come down again. So I would just I would still listen to that. Okay, let's see. 
Um, so there's, there's a couple other, um, there are a couple other sort of uh, things that were on from, from last week as well that have been starred here. So this is one that's from Carnivore Scott, who said, um, what are your thoughts on possibly reversing portal vein hypertension, which is, which is Scott's issue? Uh, a lot of different things can cause portal vein hypertension. So that's a, you know, that's a very specific and significant uh, medical issue. Um, you know, I think that obviously the same dietary principles apply. You eat what your body's designed to eat, and then at least you're, you're removing out any potential issue that, that an inappropriate diet can cause, uh, have to contribute to that. However, portal vein hypertension is, is a very, um, specific issue and, and could very well have, um, problems that, that are going to, uh, not be amenable to just diet alone. So it depends on what's causing the portal vein hypertension. You can at least try to, uh, you know, eat this way and just eat carnivore. Your name's carnivore Scott. So I'm assuming that you already do. Um, and if that helps and that's great. And if it doesn't, then you need to go, uh, through the traditional sort of treatments and methods to, um, you know, to help, to help your situation. Sometimes that's surgical, sometimes that's medical, but uh, I wouldn't ignore it. I wouldn't, uh, just, just say, well, I'm just going to eat this way and, and hope for the best. You know, that's, um, you know, there are, there are other things that, cause harm to our bodies besides just the things that we eat. And sometimes the things that we eat cause harm in our body that can't just be reversed by switching the way we eat because there's, there's permanent damage done. So, you know, eat carnivore diet, high fat carnivore diet. Absolutely. And then, uh, you know, talk to your doctor about, you know, getting that, that treated in traditional ways as well and find out what's causing your portal vein hypertension and seeing if that can be reversed. So Zachary Scott um, says, after rectal cancer, chemo, radiation, and surgery, uh, as Professor Seafried said, I'm fighting the battle of treatment effects uh, ahead, maybe. Um, thanks, Dr. Chafee. I've been a big fan for over a year. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And and I'm really glad that you've, you've come across this stuff, and, and hopefully it is helping you in your treatment uh, against uh, cancer and, and hopefully recovering from that fight, you know, chemo radiation surgery is a big, you know, it's a big hit to the system, you know, and obviously that's when you need proper nutrition the most is when your, your body's in a, in a compromised state. So hopefully this, this is something that helps you, helps you get better, helps you recover, helps you feel better. And, uh, will also hopefully help keep your, your cancer in remission or, or put it there if you're not there already. So good luck with that. Okay, so uh, Calafu, thank you for, very much for the super chat. Uh, teenager with optical nerve thinning uh, slash atrophy with calcium deposits on one of the eyes shown on MRI. Any suggestions or opinion of what can be done? Um, and again, it depends on what's causing these sorts of things. A lot of times you can get thinning, atrophy, inappropriate calcium deposition due to eating inappropriate things as well. So that's always the go-to, you know, just try fixing your diet, try going on a carnivore diet, high fat meat-based carnivore diet, uh, cut out all the other things and see what happens. And if it, if it does help, then great. And if it doesn't help, well, you know, you still have your doctor. So nerve thinning can be for a number of different reasons. Nutrition is a major part of that. If you don't have proper nutrition, if you don't have proper uh, fatty acids, if you don't have appropriate amount of cholesterol, if you don't have an appropriate amount of B12, which almost no one does, then you can, you can get demyelination. You can get thinning or wasting of your uh, nervous tissue. And so, you know, why wouldn't you address that first and foremost while you're investigating other sorts of things, inappropriate calcium deposits. It's generally pathological in nature. If you're seeing calcium start getting deposited where it shouldn't be, you know, that's, that's a, some sort of pathology that's going on and could, and, and absolutely can be caused by, um, uh, diet. So that's the first thing you do. That's the first thing you address. And then you work with your doctor to see, you know, what else can be uh, the problem and what else can be, um, at play here and potentially reversible. But a lot of these things, 
you know, they're idiopathic and, and, and you look at that and a neurosurgeon or a neurologist looks at that and goes, Oof, yeah, well, that's what's going on. No idea why, you know? And so, uh, you know, do work with your doctor, do work with a neurologist on this, but, um, you know, if, but also try the diet, you know, eat what you're supposed to eat and, and a lot of things just to start working better as a result of that. So that's what you try. You, you do that, but you also see your doctor and work with them on trying to figure out what's going on. And, you know, if it starts getting better on its own because of the way you're eating, great, problem solved. And if not, you know, you'll need the help of, of your doctor to try to figure out well, anything, something you can do. So good luck with that. Hopefully it's it uh, just resolves itself. So thank you, Jordan Vardy, for the super chat. Uh, 28-year-old male, 17-day carnivore MRI uh, on upper and lower back. Neurosurgeon said, discs in my back are dehydrated. Is this reversible? He said, it's not reversible. It's traditionally not reversible. Um, but I've, I've seen people who have reversed this. I've seen people on MRI who have done this. I just actually interviewed um, uh, a lady who had this. She had like multi-layer disc degeneration, desiccated discs all the way up and down her spine. Uh, you know, throughout her thoracic spine and, and elsewhere. And then she goes carnivore and it just, whoop, they just reinflate. She was also doing um, inversion therapy. So she's sort of hanging upside down, letting that stretch out. That's, that's how your discs reinflate, uh, get those, that fluid sort of back in there is, is, you know, from uh, gravity and lack of gravity. So when we're laying down and we're sleeping, we wake up in the morning, we're actually slightly taller than we are at the end of the day because at the you know the you, gravity's off when you're when you're just laying down and these things start to reinflate and then you stand up and just gravity just starts sinking it back down and just sort of pressing those out so that's how nutrients get in and out of the disc and so when the when that happens you're, you're sort of you know getting getting more nutrients and uh and food into those discs to keep to keep them healthy one thing that an inversion table can do is it just sort of how it helps gravity stretch those things out a bit more. Um, I had pancake discs, L4-5 and L5-S1 when I was 20 on MRI. And uh, I went carnivore shortly after that. And I started using an inversion table because my, my uncle uh, had one and said it really helped his back. And back problems were gone after a few months and they stayed gone for a long time. No idea what the hell is my back's doing now. Um, I haven't gotten an MRI since then, but it, um, it certainly symptomatically helped me quite a lot. So yes, I have seen that get better. It's not going to get better doing traditional things, you know, which is why he's saying that, uh, or she, but, um, there are people that have gone carnivore that have, that have reinflated their disc. This lady that, um, that I just spoke to last week, she said that, um, she gained like an inch. She actually grew like an inch taller, like since since she went carnivore because her, her discs just all sort of reinflated. So, you know, it is possible, but you know, we're we're basing things off of, you know, what ha what happens traditionally with people eating a normal diet in a normal traditional way, and it's just like, yeah, it doesn't happen. But you know, orthopedic surgeons will also tell you that you only put on, you only lay down bone um, density until 25 and then after that you don't put on anything it's just you're just this fight against entropy and it's just going downhill from there that's not true either it's just that eating a traditional diet it, it it's that's the case but when people are eating a carnivore diet in their 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s i've seen people reverse osteoporosis by going on a carnivore diet and adding in resistance exercise so um i've certainly seen that where people can reinflate their discs um but I, you know, that's what I would do. You know, if, if you have some specific medical issue or you're not able to go upside down, then, you know, don't worry about it. But uh, yeah, you know, that that's something that um, I have seen that people can reinflate those things. It's, it's um, doesn't mean that that's going to happen for you, though. It just means that that has happened for other people. And so those are the things that I've done. And those are the people, things that uh, other people that, have, that I've spoken to have done. Um, carnivore diet and inversion table. See how you go. I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen? It, they don't reinflate and you're exactly in the same position you are right now. So, I mean, who cares? You know, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt you uh, unless there's a specific reason why hanging upside down in your particular case can hurt you. But, you know, for most people it's fine. Um, 
and um, uh, and carnivore diet certainly not going to hurt you. It's only going to help. So, you know, just see what happens, you know, and if, uh, if it doesn't work, then you're in the exact same position, except you have a better diet and you feel better. So might as well just run with it and um, hope for the best. And hopefully that does sort you out. If it does, you know, let us know, um, come back and, and leave a comment or, um, you know, comment, uh, send me a message, all these sorts of things. So always good to know, always see what people's results are. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the carnivore market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products there will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks, guys. Janet Wilson. Um, oh, Janet Jen just has a comment. Here's this. Hi, Dr. C. I'm the Janet from your challenge group. Well, hello, Janet. Nice to see you here. I uh, just wanted to thank you for your example, knowledge, and inspiration, and motivation. So thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad that it's uh, helpful. And um, thank you for joining the group and thank you for joining the live. It's good to see you here. Uh, so Aiken, thank you for the super chat. Good day, Dr. Chafee. I'm getting uh, the first fasting HbA1c since uh, going on carnivore this Saturday. Would fasting from today add any benefit rather than 12 hours? For HbA1c, not necessarily. You know, that's that's going to be an average over about three months, depending on how long your your red blood cells live. And, you know, people on a carnivore diet could potentially have their... their um, their uh, red blood cells live longer. Certainly if they were eating, you know, plant fats and oils with plant sterols before that, you know, typically those don't last even as long as three months. Now you get rid of all those things. You might be able to live longer than three months. So, um, but yeah, but, but a few days isn't going to change that um, for your hba one c So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that. And uh, yeah, see, see how you go. Um, do also, um, you know, mark that against your blood sugar. You know, if you you take your blood sugar every now and then, because, you know, sometimes it doesn't match up. Sometimes people have a higher HbA1c than their daily, you know, finger prick blood test would, uh, you know, would establish normally. And so that could suggest that your, your red blood cells are living longer or shorter or whatever. So, um, you know, longer if it's higher. And uh, so just keep that in mind as well. Uh, he just goes on to say here, I'm already intermittent fasting, a uh, 23 hour fast with one meal. I think that's fine. I don't think that, I don't think you need to change anything for uh, an HbA1c anyway. You want to have, for, for your other tests, you want to have the same fasting status each time you take the test so that you know that you, you have a, a regular pattern to, um, you have a regular pattern to your, uh, you know, your, your um, blood test, right? So you have you have the same fasting status. You want to be fasting 11, 12 hours, right? Every time, you know, if you start fasting 16 hours versus nine hours versus no hours, you're going to get different results for a lot of tests. Some some will be the same, but others others it will affect. And so if you just do that as a general rule and just keep it very uniform, you'll get more reliable results. So Lena, thank you for the super chat. Can carnivore get rid of cellulite and stretch marks? If I weigh 150 and eat 100 uh, grams of protein because I get full of fat, uh, will I have muscle loss? No, you won't get muscle loss. You will, um, you know, just eat just eat the amount of fat and protein that your body wants and is asking you for, and and you'll be fine. So you just keep eating until fatty meat stops tasting good, and you'll be fine. Uh, cellulite can be sensitive to uh, insulin and uh, ketogenic diets. And so people have improved their cellulites by going on ketogenic diets like a, a carnivore diet. So that is something that people have seen. Stretch marks are, are permanent scars, but they, they can soften. They can, so they can be a softer appearance, not as sort of uh, harsh and doesn't don't stand out as much. And so while they typically won't go away, they can become much less noticeable and your skin 
quality health and collagen can improve a lot as well. And so that can improve uh, the appearance of, of stretch marks also. And a lot of that, a lot of scars can fade, you know, quite significantly. I've had, um, yeah, I've had a lot of scars, uh, not like the deep like surgical scars, really. Those are pretty much the same, but things like, like here, I used to have these big nasty scars here from a class or a head to head in a rugby game. Um, this idiot on my team was just completely out of position. So I was going up to tackle him and he was like tracking him from behind and then just tried to hit him from behind. So as I hit into him, he came in from behind and his head was on the same side as mine. And so we just went smash head to head. So he should have realized that. And so as I couldn't see him, but he was sort of tracking from behind. And so he should put his head on the other side and, um, uh, you know, to, to get away from mine. But uh, he just wasn't, well, he was out of position in the first place. So he really wasn't thinking and just smashed in his whole forehead split open. And, um, and he was on the ground, just knocked out. And I was just, I had, I went blank from it. All of a sudden, just like going to tackle this guy, all of a sudden just massive, huge welling of pain in, uh, in my head. And then all of a sudden I just, just goes black and I'm like on my hands and knees. And all of a sudden I, my vision returns. I'm looking down the ground. I just see blood coming down. Um, and I was just like, right. All right. <laughs> I just started walking off the field there. No, no, JV, sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm like, nope, get the hell away from me. I'm going, I'm just walking away and got there. And like the trainer was there like pre pressing like hell. I mean, like it was just like smashed my head. I like a skull fracture and he's like, they're pressing like that. I'm like, okay, this is, this is not helpful. And, um, uh, our, team doctor who was also my boss at the hospital. Um, he was like head of, you know, the concussion uh, research sort of programs and the emergency medicine, you know, for the, the training emergency training program. Um, and, uh, you know, he's professional, uh, you know, national team doctor and, and uh, all that sort of stuff. And he's like, knows all about concussions. And I, the other guy was you know, on the ground wiped out. He's like, Oh yeah, no concussion protocol. Like he's, you know, he's going to be out for at least 23 days. You're going to have to do this assessment, that assessment, this, 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 and this. And he's talking about how he can't go back and play. But I was like, um, you know, so I, I played for this team because it was, you know, it wasn't like the highest level team, but it was, uh, it was one that my boss supported. And that was, that was, he really wanted me to play there. And so I was just like, as like, a, like a favorite him, I said, okay, I'll, I'll play for this team. And um, so it was, you know, and so I was sort of like someone he really wanted on the field. And, um, and so he's talking about this guy who's just like, no, 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 he's not going to be able to play for 23 days. He's got to be off this that, and the other, and I'm getting all bandaged up and he sort of th stops and thinks about it. And he's like, oh, wait, so Chafee was on this other side of this. And probably that would apply to him too. And he just looks at me and goes, you're good to go back in though. Right. And I'm like, yeah, fine, whatever. <laughs> so I could just like, you know, put a big gauze pack on it strapped it up and went and finished the game. And then he like, he stitched me up in the, in the locker room after that. And then I was in work the next day uh, in the hospital and I'm like seeing patients in the emergency department. And I just had this big, angry, nasty uh, wounds and people were looking at me like, oh, is he the doctor or the patient? Like what's going on? And um, sometimes it's good to have those sorts of things because when you're more banged up and unwell than the people coming in like it's really easy to say look you're not sick enough you don't need to come in for some reason people really want to get admitted to hospitals in some places they just they just they really get offended if you just say yeah you've got a cold go home um and um, they're like no i just i'm sick so i have to go to the hospital when you're sick you go to the hospital like no when you're dying you come to the hospital when you can't fight off an infection yourself without hospitalization you come to the hospital um so yeah, different there, but, um, that scar in any case has, has faded dramatically. So it's actually, um, not all that easy to see anymore. Uh, you have to really sort of look for it and it doesn't really show up that easy on, on camera. So I don't know if you can even see that, but, um, but yeah, so it'll, it'll calm down anyway. The stress match will calm down, but you know, it is scar tissue. And so some of that's going to stay and you'll still have those marks, but it, they get a lot better. They really, really do. Uh, another super chat from Lana. Thank you very much. Does one ounce of cheese increase appetite? Should butter be cut for weight loss? Does butter cause soreness the next day? What about eggs? Butter typically does not um, cause any soreness. If you're very sensitive to dairy and the casein proteins in there, then 
possibly, but um, most people aren't. Um, and then eggs, some people respond negatively to eggs. So just, just see how your body reacts to those, but usually it wouldn't, wouldn't cause soreness. It just, people just have a bit, you know, of a, of a bit of a reaction to them. And, um, no, I don't think you should, you need to cut butter for weight loss. If you're just adding some butter to meat to increase the fat content, sometimes that can help because you, you want to stimulate your metabolism and, and bolster your metabolism up as opposed to limiting out, um, uh, nutrition, which will actually trigger your body to lower your metabolism. Um, one ounce of cheese is not all that much. Um, the, the risk with, with dairy in general and in the, in the case of morphines is that they'll stimulate hunger or you'll just sort of eat more compulsively. One ounce of cheese shouldn't be all that much, you know, but if you're finding that you're not getting the results that you want or as quickly as you want, then just try cutting all that, that out and just eat fatty meat with a lot of animal fat. Try to get, you know, the off cut fat trimmings from the butcher to, uh, to bolster up the amount of fat that you're eating uh, instead of relying on butter. If you think that that's causing an issue. And so, yeah, that's just, that's what you do. So if you're, if you're doing fine with that, you know, one ounce of cheese should be okay for most people. Eggs are okay for most people. Butter is okay for most people. If you're not having the results that you want, cut them all out. Just go to meat and water, really beef, lamb and water, and, and see how you go. Okay. So a question from uh, Super Chef from Colleen Phillips. Thank you very much. Ketovore for four years, carnivore for six months, TSH 0 0.02. Oh, that's, that's quite low. High free T4, no uptake uh, in uptake scan. A specialist says thyroiditis, increased fat, gained 10 pounds in three weeks help. Um, well, <clears throat> that's, uh, that's quite low TSH. I don't know if you've been checked for, you know, things like Graves disease potential. Um, but high free T4, did you check your free T3? Sometimes you can have high free T4 or high T4 in general and just not have, and not have that convert into T3. So you can actually have high T4 and that suppresses your TSH, but you're not getting the requisite amounts of uh, free T3 or T3 in general, because it's just not converting into um, T3 from T4. That can be a number of different issues. Zinc being a very important factor there. And if you don't have enough zinc, you won't convert T4 into T3. Um, and, you know, you're doing ketovore for four years and carnivore for six months. And then you've gained 10 pounds in three weeks, which is, you know, obviously uh, a bit surprising given that you've been doing this for a number of years. And then, you know, just carnivore for, I mean, ketovore is very close to that. And then carnivore is, you know, uh, not too much of a change from there, except maybe you've gotten rid of some goitrogens that are going to negatively affect your, your, um, uh, your thyroid. But, um, you know, what happened in those three weeks? Did something change? Did you start eating something differently? Uh, did something else happen? Did you change your medications? Um, if you're, if you're eating a certain way for four years and having consistent results and you're doing carnivore for six months and having consistent results, and then all of a sudden something changes and in three weeks you dramatically increase your weight, you have to think about, you know, what's changed during that time, what happened in, uh, you know, in that time period that changed that can make a difference. You can undo or add back in or something like that, that you're doing. So I would get the rest of your thyroid panel. I would get that, you know, if he's saying thyroiditis, okay, what's, what's the cause of thyro thyroiditis? You know, is it um, autoimmune in nature? If it is, then you just go lion diet, just red meat and water only go very, very strict. Don't need anything else. And that, that will drop down your antibodies. Um, and, uh, and also just doing that will, will lower inflammation as well. So, um, you know, ask those questions, see what's been causing that. Um, Okay, in reference to the super chat, my free T3 was fine. TSH has always been fine. Um, but your TSH is very low and your free T4 is going up. You know, that wouldn't be a real good explanation as to why you got um, you know, weight gain anyway, because your thyroid's up. You know, if it's, if it's up too high, then people 
typically lose weight. They don't gain weight. And so, you know, I would, I would wonder what, what else is happening. So what happened in those three weeks or leading up to those three weeks that changed that, that then kicked off that weight gain. That's what, that's what you sort of need to look into and find out. And if, um, if your doctor thinks it's thyroiditis, you need to find out, you know, what kind of thyroiditis and why is, is it Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Thyroiditis is it, is it, I mean, Hashimoto's generally raises your TSH and lowers your T4 and T3. So, you know, and that, that could precipitate weight gain, but I mean, you don't have the numbers typical of, of someone who would have, you know, you're not hypothyroid in that, in that regard. Um, in fact, if anything, you're hyperthyroid. And so that's, um, you know, that's interesting that that uh, would happen. So it doesn't seem to be caused from your thyroid that you're gaining 10 pounds unless it's gone completely the other way. Um, but that, those are the questions I would ask is, is um, you know, what happened? What changed in that time period? Because you're going four years and six months eating a, a certain way and then something changed and you had a very dramatic different change in three weeks. Okay, so what happened at that point? That's the important thing to find out. Uh, it's a question from Rick Diaz. During my last eye exam, my optometrist indicated concern about cholesterol. Uh, I've been on carnivore for three months now, lost 20 pounds and feel great. Any concerns with cholesterol and eye health? No, certainly not with, with eye health um, or any, any aspect of your health. Your optic nerve and all these sorts of things are, are myelinated with cholesterol and fat. Your cholesterol is, is what makes all your hormones, your skin, your hair, every single cell in your body is made out of cholesterol. Um, your brain is, is a large proportion of it's made out of cholesterol. So it's actually very good for you. So cholesterol was, was never the cause of heart disease. It was, it was an invention from the sugar companies. They made it up because people were actually finding that oof, they, there's this strong association between refined sugar and processed food and uh, heart disease, which was brand new in the 20th century. You know, it didn't have anybody die of heart attacks um, before 1912 in America. That was the first case in, in America. It was in 1912. There were a couple in Europe before that, but not that many. And people would see every now and then see, oh, look, these little weird stuff in the, in the arteries. That's not typical. We don't see that normally. But some people have this sometimes. So we could see it. We could see this stuff there. It just it wasn't as as much of a problem as um, as it is now. It wasn't it wasn't the major, major massive sort of disease that we have now. And we were eating far more meat in the 1800s, but no one was dying from it uh, shown on autopsy, really, more than a couple people in Europe. Um, and, um, and we're eating way more meat in the 1800s in America than we were in the early 1900s. So there's no association there whatsoever. And, um, you know, it wasn't until we started really massively reducing our cholesterol intake and reducing our serum levels with uh, medications and things like that, that heart, heart disease rates have only gone up. They have gone up dramatically. They've tripled since the 1970s. And people say, well, deaths have gone down. It's like, well, those are age adjusted numbers. So you can't really trust those anyway, because they've been manipulated. And uh, either way, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the rate of heart disease. Our interventions are better. People are smoking less. Uh, and we can save people from, from dying of a heart attack more. But more people are having those heart attacks. Most people, more people are having their first time heart attack. Um, and it has nothing to do with uh, cholesterol. In fact, a lot of studies show that cholesterol is protective. So um, what I would recommend is going to see um, a video I have on this. I have a number of videos on cholesterol and interviewed a lot of people like uh, Dr. Paul Mason and, um, and uh, many others on the cholesterol idea. And, and Paul Mason has a ton of uh, videos on cholesterol and heart disease on, um, on YouTube. They're excellent. Um, and I did one called the truth about cholesterol and heart disease and, um, just go through that and, uh, and, and you see what you think and see what you think about cholesterol. I think this is great for you. I think that it's really important. We make it, you know, like, why are we fighting our body naturally making a, a substance? If you just fast, if you just don't eat for five days, your LDL is going to go up. Your cholesterol is going to go up. Why is that? You know, it's not from eating meat. It's not from eating fat. It's from not eating carbs. That's the trick. So if you just don't eat carbs, your, your cholesterol goes up. My God. Um, well, we don't need carbs. We don't want carbs. It can cause harm. And so to me, our cholesterol going up is a good thing because our bodies are 
wanting to do that. And now we've dropped the anchor off our back and our body can get back to doing what it's supposed to do. So those are my thoughts on it anyway. And you can take a look at my uh, video called the truth about cholesterol and heart disease uh, for, uh, for more on that. And I have, I list, you know, I go through tons of, of studies in that and, uh, and link them down below as well. So take a look at those. Uh, freedom. Thank you very much for the super chat. Freedom says, uh, love your work. Can you please speak on uh, meat aversion and eating carnivore with kidney issues? So sometimes when you have a meat aversion, this can be for, for different reasons. Sorry, just have a little cat here. Um, meat aversion, it can be for different reasons. You know, um, if people are pregnant, sometimes they get like meat aversions. I think that's, and, you know, and, and talking to other people on it sort of confirmed my thoughts on this, is that that's probably about... Um, uh, your just body telling you, you just wants a period of fasting. You know, you have plenty of energy. You're not going to hurt the baby by fasting for a day or so. Um, it's uh, if, if you don't want to eat meat, your body's telling you just not to eat. It's not telling you to eat other things. Um, so if you have a meat aversion, just don't eat. If, if fatty meat doesn't taste good, you're not hungry, right? And, you know, just wait, it'll, it'll taste good again. It'll, it'll sound amazing again. It's just telling you, your body's just telling you don't eat right now. And so, um, and then with, uh, kidney issues, they improve. So number of patients with kidney issues, they, they all improve as long as you're getting enough water. Um, and so, uh, studies have shown that actually higher protein diets improve kidney function and people around the world are with kidney issues with CKD four or five have actually improved and, and reversed their kidney disease by going on a, um, you know, keto carnivore diet, uh, mostly carnivore diet. And so you can go to different Facebook groups. We have tens of thousands of people in these things like zero carb health and zeroing in on health. I think those are two of the best ones because they're very strict and they don't mess around. They've been around for 20 years. And, um, and there's just tens of thousands of people in there talking about their issues. And you'll see, you just look in, you know, kidney failure, kidney issues, CKD, all that sort of stuff. You'll see hundreds of threads talking about this sort of thing and, and seeing people improve dramatically on that. Question from Hannah E. Thank you very much, Hannah, for the super chat. Husband is doing carnivore for six months. Triglycerides are 277, uh, total cholesterol 540, A1C is 5. Great. C peptide 1.9. He feels great, but worried about triglycerides. Any suggestions? Um, yeah, just get more data points down the road, you know, because we don't know what direction that's going in, you know. So if he tested before that and his triglycerides have gone up, then it's generally due with stress and poor sleep. Those are the main the main issues there, and so um, that is, is something that obviously needs to be addressed. So, um, but it could very well be that his triglycerides were higher than that, and they've come down. And so that's the important thing is looking for the trend, looking for the the pattern. So you're going is this going up? Is this going down? Is this staying flat line? See what's happening. So yeah, those triglycerides aren't aren't where you want them to be, but. Where were they before? You know, if those were higher than that 500, that's a massive improvement, right? So, you know, and that's typically what happens. People, people just improve their their triglycerides and uh, their HDL go in very positive directions. Total cholesterol sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. Total LDL sometimes goes up, sometimes goes down. I tend to not worry about it myself. My uh, I, my feeling is is that. You know, your body's going to do what it's, it's designed to do and supposed to do when you're eating what you're designed to eat. And that uh, cholesterol has been falsely vilified for um, for uh, heart disease when it's absolutely not the cause of it. And um, large population studies have shown that uh, higher levels of LDL actually uh, are associated with living longer. So they're associated with longevity. So, you know, why are we, why are we fighting this total cholesterol as well? Higher total cholesterol, lower rates of cardiovascular disease, mortality rates. I mean, like, why are we, why are we pretending that uh, cholesterol is causing this disease? It's not at all. That was an invention by the sugar companies, like I said. So, um, triglycerides being up, what direction are they going in is the thing. So check them again in three months and see what's going on. Make sure he's getting enough sleep. Make sure he's reducing stress. Make sure he's getting getting those blood tests at a consistent time. If he's getting those at different times of the day, he's going to get different results. If he's getting them, you know, fasted or unfasted, he's going to get different results. If he's getting it 
eight hours of fasting versus 12 hours of fasting is going to get different results. If you say 12 hours versus 16 hours, he's going to get different results. Uh, you know, cholesterol tests are extremely temperamental. And that's another reason why I think they're just a, an absolute waste of time and money. Um, so get it done consistently. First thing in the morning, same fasting period, same hydration period, um, status, you know, all these sorts of things. If he exercises the day before, cholesterol is going to be different. Had sex the morning over the day before, it's going to be different. So all of these things make a difference. And so you just want to do consistent pattern and cut all those things out, all those little um, th variables that could affect this. And then just get more data points and just see. And if his triglycerides are up or not really going down, you know, address the the, the variability in the way he's taking the, the tests and also address stress and sleep. Those are the main things. But it'll go down. It'll 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 go down as long as he's sleeping enough and and not uh, overly stressed and uh, getting things consistent and with the the way he's testing. Um, and Benison over on X says, "Have you seen cold sores improving on a carnivore diet?" Um, uh, people's frequencies, yeah, can go down, and they can um, uh, certainly keep them into remission. Your just immune system gets gets better, so uh, people. Uh, typically report that they don't they don't get as much of those yeah I mean it's not going to get rid of them these things are they live in your your um, your uh, ganglion so they, they're just sort of they inserted themselves in you know as a retrovirus so living in your own DNA so you're you're never getting it out of there unless those cells die um, and so you know that's um, uh, that's probably not going to happen to get all those things died off which you probably don't want anyway because that means you're getting nerve damage. So uh, the the main thing is just improving your your immune system so that that it just suppresses that and that that's typically what we see. Lance uh, had a question, Doc. Have you encountered patients with necrotizing fasciitis? I had it in two thousand twenty three. Had surgery on uh, foot and in and I'm in wound care, stem cell, fish skin treatments. Uh, doctors keep pushing plant-based diet for recovery. My ass. Okay. So, I mean, they just don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, they just have absolutely no idea what the hell they're talking about. I mean, you, you want a plant-based, so you can get what a lack of uh, amino acids and collagen. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, no, don't listen to a word those idiots say. Um, and, and please call them idiots for me and, and, and give them my email. Um, because I, I want to call them idiots too. I mean, that's just absurd. You know, ask them for one, one, piece of experimental data showing that a plant-based diet helps in this in this state. And if, if they can't produce it, why the hell are they suggesting this to patients? That's malpractice. I mean, that is that is frank malpractice. So um, yeah, that's that's just ridiculous. Um, to oof, that pisses me off. So um, uh, no, I haven't uh, I haven't uh, talked to people in your in your position. But, um, you know, if you're if you're eating, you know, a proper human diet and your body's going to have all the amino acids and fat and cholesterol and proteins and, and uh, enzymes and things like that, that you require for life and rebuilding your tissue, then that's obviously going to help you recover from these things. It can recover from any surgery, higher protein diets have always been shown to improve uh, surgical outcomes and, uh, and healing tissue. And so, you know, the idea that you should go plant-based and just completely screw that up and never have B12 again in your life is, um, probably one of the dumbest things that I've ever heard a doctor say, and I've heard some really dumb things. Um, but it's, it's just so crazy. Like why the hell are doctors pushing a plant? Oh, you got to go plant-based to heal your necrotizing fasciitis. Where, where, where's that in the literature? Why are you pulling that out of your ass? Um, that, yeah, that's really annoying. No, don't listen to them. Don't listen to a word they say. Probably don't listen to them on any advice ever, because if they're making that up, what else are they making up? What else are they lying to you about? What else have they gotten wrong? You know, if they've gotten all these, all these people, they've got all these things wrong. And then you're listening to their advice on other things too. I mean, you have to sort of wonder about that. You know, I've spoken to, you know, doctors that have said that, you know, and they have their own health issues and they're going to these doctors and, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I you know this is what you do, need to do. Get rid of meat, plant-based, all these sorts of things. And, and for this specific issue. And they're like, yeah, that's actually not what the data shows. And that's actually not what the literature shows. And, um, and, you know, and they knew this and they were like thinking like, well, if you got that wrong, you know, what, what else do you have wrong? You know, what, what else do you, what else are you telling me that you are convinced is correct? 
and is completely bogus. You know, that's what Mark Twain said. He said, it's not, it's not what you don't know that, uh, that gets you. It's what you know for certain that just ain't so. And so, because then you're like, no, 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 this is definitely what it is. And then, I mean, you're just, you're just really, really hammering down the wrong path. And so, uh, that is definitely where you are at with this one. So, well, that's scary. Um, no, do, do your own thing with the diet. Um, I would not listen to a word they say on that, you know, you know, the treatment fine, um, you know, with actual sort of wound care and all that sort of stuff, but you know, anything about the plant-based, uh, yeah, don't, don't listen to a word that they say about that. You need animal fats and proteins and B12 and all these other sorts of, you know, essential, essential nutrients uh, in order to heal properly and have a proper immune system that's going to allow you to heal properly and to fight off this infection and keep that infection away. Um, it wasn't until we went to agriculture that we started seeing widespread signs of uh, systemic disease and infection in skeletons like tuberculosis that happened immediately after agriculture. Why, why are we telling people to go plant-based to help our immune system when we know for a cold frozen fact, it makes populations sick and it gets them more susceptible to infectious disease. It's just, it's just absolutely ludicrous. So, um, no, I would not, I would not do that. I would not recommend a plant-based diet for anybody at any time in any situation ever, and certainly not uh, healing from necrotizing fasciitis. Yet some has a question. Uh, Doc, I just finished watching Carnivore versus Vegan video you recently participated in. Uh, you were too nice, <laughs> uh, and I'm being nice. Uh, you were too nice. He was pretentious. Well, you know, you have to try to be nice and, and just, you know, civil and mature and just let the people sort of, you know, screen themselves out. People see, you know, generally see that. Um, I was, um, you know, I was way too nice in, uh, you know, uh, one of the other debates that I did because I was trying to have just a civil discourse and they were not doing that and they were being a complete prick. And, uh, and so this time I was just like, yeah, all right, I'm, I'll be civil, but I'm not going to give him an inch. And, uh, and so I didn't do that. And especially when, when he started, um, you know, going ad hominem and saying, wow, what's the point of talking to this guy He's a pseudoscientist. I'm like, hmm, interesting. That was a big mistake. Yeah, that's not what you wanted to say right now, because after that, I was just like, I just, I didn't let him get an inch. Anything that he said, any, uh, you know, unqualified statement that he said, I didn't let him slip by anything. I just cut off and says, it's like, where's the study for that? How are you saying that? You made this statement, you made this claim and it's wrong. You know, where does this say? What is your evidence for that? And, oh, well, but I mean, everyone knows. And then everyone else was like, well, yeah, well, why, why did you say that? You know, why, you know, that's that, well, where's that evidence from? Well, where are you getting that from? And like, you just didn't have an answer. I just would not let him let him up on that because it was just like, you know, it's like, all right, you want to play that game? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so yeah. Um, <laughs> um, the other thing is that, I mean, you don't want to be mean to people, you know, I don't, I don't actually disagree with their motivations. You know, uh, I, I disagree with, you know, the, a lot of their actions and the way they, they go about, you know, trying to, to bring about the changes that they want. Um, I don't disagree with their motivations, you know, wanting to, to protect the animals and you, you should, you should protect things that can't protect themselves. Um, you know, and, uh, that's, that's, you know, human nature to try to protect, um, you know, protect, you know, defend the defenseless. Um, and so that's not a, that's not a bad motivation. And, um, I just don't think that it's, it's, um, the right way to do it. I, I think that it has a lot of other knock on effects that are seriously going to damage people's health. And that you can't actually do that safely um, for the vast majority of people and certainly not optimally for anybody. And uh, you're getting a lot of people, I mean, 90% of, of medical issues that we treat in, in the world are, as doctors are these non-commutable chronic diseases that don't exist. If you don't eat plants, they just don't exist. If you get enough fatty meat and you don't eat plants, these don't exist. The vast majority of them don't exist. And so, um, you know, that, that's important. And, you know, having people die of, you know, dementia and uh, cancer and autoimmunity and kids not developing properly. And, you know, one in 22 uh, boys will have autism. One in thir 34 uh, people in general will have autism now, whereas one in 10,000 back in the 70s. I mean, that's not ethical. I mean, you, you cannot... You cannot support a system that does that to people and destroys their bodies and brains like that. You just can't. Um, so 
you know, and then there's more animals die as a result of cr plant agriculture and, and, and monocropping. I mean, it just destroys the environment. So, you know, the, the motivations are right. It's just, they're, they're seeing things at a surface level and, you know, they're not, they're, they're not, you know, seeing it from, from a broad scale view. They're, they're you know, they're missing forest for the trees. They're very focused on this tree, this issue, and they're not seeing, you know, the, the grand scheme of things. And I think that that's important to do. And there are a lot of people coming over from the vegan vegetarian side because they were like, oh crap, that's, um, yeah, that's what that is. Um, I just had an interview with uh, Lear Keith who wrote a book called The Vegetarian Myth, which is excellent by the way, you know, people should check that out. Uh, we had it in our book club and Patreon and she was kind enough to come on and, and talk about it. And I just interviewed her now, literally just now. And um, I'll be putting that up in the, in the coming weeks. And, um, you know, she goes through about all these, these, these myths about how this is better for the environment. It's what we're designed to eat. This is really good for us. This is really good for animals. It's like, these are, these are all wrong and we're being misled and we're being manipulated. And that's the thing people, people's kindness and, and good intentions are being manipulated for the greed and, um, you know, and, uh, benefit of, of, uh, nasty people that, that make trillions and trillions of dollars off us eating garbage and getting sick and having to pay for the sickness and treatment for that. So, um, you know, the people that profit the most from that are the ones that want us eating this crap and staying sick. And so, you know, you don't, yeah, just good to stay out, out of that whole, whole side of things. But, you know, it's important to sort of make these points and point this out to people. And, you know, most people that follow me on Instagram and, and YouTube, most of the people here, you know, leave in the comments, you know, if this is you, were at one point vegan vegetarian and then they they either saw that what they were doing was not actually making the difference that they wanted it to and there were better ways of doing that or they were getting so sick that um, they really had to make a, a change in their life and so and sometimes sometimes both so um more and more people are coming around to this so having these conversations while they can be a bit tedious and obnoxious hopefully they do good and, and bring people around JLP, thank you for the super chat. Um, does the iron from meat age you faster due to free radicals and rust? Don't want to age fast. No, just the opposite. You know, the the iron in meat is uh, heme iron is more bioavailable, so you're just getting an appropriate amount of iron. You're not getting too much iron, and it's not going to uh, rust you. It's um, it's going to make your body work normally and appropriately. So you know, it's um, and it's more about it's more about the iron metabolism as well. Um, you need enough iron, but you know, if you get too much like hemochromatosis, someone that, that can't metabolize, um, iron as well. And so they, they sort of have a buildup of it, you know, they might need to get, get, you know, give blood and things like that. But, um, you know, typically when people go on a carnivore diet, it actually improves their metabolism in general and their metabolism of iron as well. And so at least some people have uh, been able to regulate their iron uh, normally and not had to donate blood anymore. I have, I have, you know, uh, one patient that does that. I'll be seeing uh, a lady's husband. I just had a patient uh, yesterday. Her husband has hemochromatosis and he's going to come in and see me as well. And we'll see what we can do for him. But um, I at least have one patient now that has stopped needing to give blood because his, uh, iron levels are normal now, which is great. So, uh, no, that's, that's not going to harm you. You're not going to age faster. In fact, you'll age backwards. Most people typically, you know, lose 10 years off their face and their body slims down, um, and, um, becomes much more lean and, um, muscular and athletic and, and, um, yeah, typically typical signs of, of, uh, youthful appearance and, um, and, uh, yeah, improving hormones and all these different sorts of ways. People coming out of menopause, you know, 10 years after, well, no, not 10 years, but like, I've seen like six, seven years after menopause, women coming out of menopause and, and getting their periods again, and having perfectly normal estrogen again, you know, what's that if not aging backwards, right? you know, 70 year old men tripling their testosterone to the level that you would expect to see in a healthy 25 year old, right? Most 25 year olds don't have a healthy 25 year olds testosterone these days. Um, and this 72 year old man does now. So, I mean, you know, that's, um, 
that's uh, that's aging backwards. You know, so no, you're not gonna you're not gonna age uh, faster on this. It's quite the you know quite the contrary. Uh, little Ellie Melly, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, very nice to see you. Um, the most helpful doctor with the kindest heart. All oh, very sweet of you. Thank you. Uh, Ardvark Jones, <laughs> that's a great name. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Uh, when eating steak after chewing, I end up spitting out a lot of the meat, especially if it has a lot of connective tissue and or is too dry and flavorless. Am I missing out on nutrients by doing this? Not necessarily. You know, the gristle you don't necessarily need. Um, you know that tough connective tissue that's that's hard to sort of chew. Some of that will break down. Some of that you'll get, you know, some collagen and other sorts of things from that. Uh, but mo actually, a lot of it you'll actually just end up passing out um, in your stools. So it's um, uh, that's what a Salisbury steak was: is you ground meat in a way that sort of filtered that stuff out. So you just got the soft meat and the soft fat, and they typically add butter to that because a lot of the fat would come off with the gristle. And so it. Um, uh, is, uh, and, and then people would just like, not just not defecate for like, which is weeks at a time because there just wasn't, they were just absorbing absolutely everything that they were eating. Um, so no, you don't necessarily need to eat that stuff. You know, a lot of it, you will have a difficult time, um, absorbing anyway. Um, as long as it's connective tissue, if you're just skipping out on the, on the meat and the fat itself, then yeah, you probably do want to eat that. If it's dry, maybe think about, how you're cooking it and maybe um, cook it in a way, add butter, things like that, that may make it more uh, flavorful and, um, and juicy. Uh, Dustin Jones, thank you for the super chat. When I eat my first meal at noon, 60, 40 ground beef or ribeye, I sometimes feel like I'm going to vomit for a few seconds on and off carnivore since October. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, you don't have to eat uh, as much as all that, that you make yourself feel sick. If you are eating a lot more fat than your body is typically used to, then it's quite normal to feel a bit nauseous. Um, so you can just ease into it a bit more. You know, don't don't eat quite so much. Eventually, your body will get used to the fat content. We make ourselves feel sick because we've told ourselves to feel sick from um, from an early age, saying that oh, meat's bad for us, fat's bad for us. It's going to make us sick. It's going to give us uh, diabetes and heart disease and all these sorts of things, uh, they won't. And so, you know, having a bit of meat with a bit of, uh, uh, a bit of fat with a bit of lean meat, you know, eat those together. It tastes good. You know, at, at first when I was eating a piece of fat, it would, it was just, Ooh, no, you don't eat that. Um, I had to, I had to re retrain myself to eat more fat. Now I can just eat chunks of fat and they taste amazing. Um, and I want them. So, uh, just do that, you know, just ease into it um, recondition yourself, you know, we, we're, we're born to like fat and, um, you know, it's just, it's just our mental hang up that fat's bad for us and it's not. So just, uh, recondition yourself, let your, let your body and your brain know that, that, um, fat's good for you to eat the fat. Don't eat so much that it's going to make you nauseous. Just stop early and then just, you know, get on with it. Um, eventually your body will get used to it again. And, and, uh, you just keep telling yourself that the fat's, good for you. And this is a good thing. And you're going to start feeling better. And you're going to start associating that, that better feeling with the stuff that you're eating, the fat that you're eating and, and things will, things will get better. It just takes a bit of time. Uh, Joanne E. Thank you very much for the super chat. Carnivore for 303 days today. Awesome. Uh, 55 pounds down 40 to 50 to go. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, 55 pounds in less than a year. I mean, that's, that's a major, major, major accomplishment. Most people don't lose that much weight at all ever. And so, you know, it's, uh, that's fantastic. Keep going. That's, um, that's really good work. So no cheat days, no sweeteners or alcohol had a weight loss stall since February, increased fat to 70, 30, to 80, 20 over the past month. Any advice? I'm assuming calories from fat, 70, 30, 80, 20. Um, same thing. Um, I think that's a that's a good thing to do, you know, trying to you know increase the fat, but also just just make sure that you're eating enough. You're eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Um, you also didn't mention anything about dairy. If you have any dairy, just cut all that out. Um, um, you can also start uh, adding in some exercise. If you are exercising, also remember that 
you're going to put on muscle and bone. And so that can offset the fat that you're losing. So the most important thing is the, uh, your health, you know, just feeling good, feeling better and feeling your best. And, um, you know, you need to do the other things as well, sleeping properly, reducing stress, those are really important things. Um, and they can also stall your weight loss as well. Um, so improving sleep or optimizing sleep, prioritizing sleep, making sure that you are a priority, that your sleep is a priority and you get, uh, you know, good seven to eight hours. If you're able to sleep and without and wake up without a, an alarm clock, that's the ideal. Um, use a sleep mask and all that sort of stuff and make sure that lights are off at night to make sure that you're getting good quality sleep. And um, that can make a big difference. Get outside, um, you know, start, start doing, being a bit more active, go for walks. Your body's going to want to start moving. It's designed to move. And um, while it's not about, oh, you just have to work yourself out into a smaller dress size. Um, that's not, that's not required, but it is helpful. And it does help your body improve both from a metabolic point of view and a hormonal point of view and, uh, and from a, a body fat point of view. So it can absolutely help. And so, you know, if you're at that point where you're feeling a lot better, you've been doing this for a while, see if you can start adding in some more exercises, start going for walks, doing things outside that are active, that are just, that is just things that you enjoy. And, um, and that can help these things as well. So, and also just, just keep going with it, you know, just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Enjoy your life. Make sure that you're feeling good and that, um, and uh, you optimize all these other sorts of things and things usually sort of click into place. Um, and, uh, definitely cut out dairy, all dairy, uh, even butter. If you're having, if you're having a stall, um, and you don't know why else it can be, then, um, you know, just go to basics and, um, you know, just go fatty meat and chunks of fat and things like that and cut out all dairy and everything else and see how you go. Good luck with that. I'm sure you'll do great. Uh, Taylor Kernahan, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, my auntie is 52 and has terminal cancer. I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, has been eating high carb diet forever. Yeah, pretty common. How can I convince her to go keto carnivore? Any thoughts on carbs and cancer? Yeah, a lot of thoughts on carbs and cancer. Um, it's it's something that's actually pretty well studied. There are you know, hundreds of studies on uh, ketogenic metabolic therapy. Many of you know, tons of them in humans. I mean, there's like there's over 20 just in uh, GBM, you know, uh, glioblastoma brain cancers. And, uh, and there's tons and other, other cancers as well. And, and even more in animal studies and animal models. I mean, just, uh, just, just tons of these things, right? So I would absolutely uh, show her my uh, video on, um, with Thomas Seafried, Professor Seafried over at Boston College. And he's one of the, you know, the world premier, uh, cancer research is uh, well over 150 um, peer-reviewed publications out in the literature at the moment on ketogenic metabolic therapy and cancer and how it affects cancer. And, and he particularly um, studies uh, GBM, but it's not the only one. He, he does tons and tons and tons of other studies as well. So I would definitely look into that. So watch that, that interview with him. Um, I also have a lecture on ketogenic metabolic therapy as an adjunct to standard of care in cancer treatments um, on YouTube. That's, that's pretty much the name. <laughs> I think that's that is the name pretty much verbatim, and that's on the low carb down under website. So that was at a um, a conference that I spoke at in San Diego last year. And so um, take a look at those. Show her those, and uh, and you can show her the. I have a, a playlist on YouTube. Uh, on cancer and it has that and it has a lot of other things on cancer other talks on cancer and other uh, uh, success stories people that do this and um, and have had very positive outcomes as a result of that so um, yeah do take a look at those and hopefully you can get her to watch them and uh, and convince her to give it a try i mean it's not going to hurt her i mean at the very least it's going to help her chemo and radiation i mean that's been shown in um you know multiple studies that that um in particular uh two that i can think of in 2018 2019 where they they showed that um uh being in ketosis fasting or on a ketogenic diet during chemo and radiation um 
is um, beneficial to the chemo. It sensitizes the cancers, the cancer cells to chemo radiation, and it protects your native cells from your healthy cells from uh, the chemo and radiation effects. So it's uh, at the very least, if it doesn't, nothing else, it's, it's going to do that. And, uh, but also there's something called the Warburg effect, which is that cancer cells require about 400 times the amount of glucose that normal cells do. And so what you're doing when you're, when you're eating carbs is you're massively increasing the amount of available energy to these cancers and they just grow like hell. Um, that's what a PET scan is. We give someone radio labeled uh, glucose and you see what sucks it up. That cancer sucks it up, right? That's because, you know, think about that every time you have a bagel or eat some cereal or a cookie or chocolate, that's just one sucked into that cancer that's feeding that cancer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, think about that. Hopefully one of those, uh, one of those, um, videos or, you know, those pieces of information can help bring her around and, and good luck to her. I hope she, I hope she, well, I hope she, gets better if she can and at least um, does as well as she can otherwise. So I'm very sorry to hear about that, but hopefully, hopefully she can, she can get better. Uh, Svetlana says, uh, interesting. I wonder what the doc feeds his cat. To, uh, just meat, same thing. What are cats meant to eat? They're meant to eat meat. What are humans meant to eat? We're meant to eat meat. So cats don't need as, as fatty of meat as humans do. So they can do well, pretty, pretty well on lean meat, giblets, uh, organs, things like that. Like my cat loves chicken gizzards, just goes to town on them. Uh, he really likes beef though, too. He's like sort of got a bit spoiled on, you know, sometimes we have some, some bit extra, you know, pieces of meat. We'll give them to him or just like, don't have any, anything. So I'll have like a roast and I'll just cut up, you know, um, a bunch of meat or just give him like a big tomahawk with some meat left on the bone. Just give him to that. And he's just this tiny little cat with this massive bone. He's just carrying it around like Fred Flintstone, you know? And, um, he gets really excited for meat. And, um, so, uh, yeah, that's what I feed him. He's very, very healthy. He's never had, never had any sort of health issues, very lean and muscular and, uh, very healthy in general. Very, he doesn't have fur. <laughs> it's just uh, how he's designed, but, um, uh, skin's very healthy. You know, some people have like these, uh, the sphinx cats and, and, uh, they say, oh, they're just so oily. They have all this and skin issues. None of that. None of that. It's just a soft, um, dry skin, you know, it's just, just normal, soft, warm skin, you know, and, uh, no issue. So yeah, he's very, very healthy and just meat, only meat, never, never give him anything else. Hey everyone, really happy to announce a new sponsor of the show for everyone in Australia, and that is Stockman Steaks, who deliver steaks and other meats direct to customer, delivering high quality grass fed and grass finished, pasture raised beef and other meats frozen to your door. They have high fat options for those of us on a keto carnivore diet, and you can even order grass fed and finished beef fat trimmings that you can fry up and add to your meal for the extra fat with high omega-3 fatty acids in it. If you're in Australia, unfortunately they're not shipping outside of Australia at the moment, but hopefully they'll be moving into other markets soon. So in Australia, you can use code CHAFEE for a free order of beef mints or another free gift as it may change from time to time. So just go down to stockmansteaks.com.au today and place your order now. Thanks guys. Uh, Sama, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, Sama says, I've been on keto for four years, carnivore for one year now, been having sleep issues for the past eight, uh, seven to eight months. Not sure if it's diet related. What could it be? Magnesium supplements didn't help. Thank you for all you do, uh, Dr. Chafee. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, if you've been doing keto carnivore for all that time and you haven't had problems up until more recently, it, it's probably not to do with the diet. Um, but, you know, maybe, you know, did you change something during that time or, or around that time? Did something change? Um, you can just, what anyone can do is just optimize your sleep routine, turn off the lights when, when the sun goes down and put on blue blocking glasses. Those actually really help. Um, they help me anyway, and, uh, they help me really wind down. And, and especially when you're on screens, you're on the computer or you're, you're in a lit room. I try to keep the room pretty dark, uh, so as not to sort of wake, wake myself up at night. And, uh, and I wear the glasses when I when I have them available, and uh, and you get off screens, you get off computers, you get off TVs, you get off your phone. Hard one to do, but you got to do it. Listen to a book on tape, read a book in low light with a like a yellow 
incandescent bulb or 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 something similar to that. So you're not getting that white light with all the blue light in it that's you know going to wake you up. Your brain tells time by the frequency of light that comes in through your eyes. And so if you're getting a whole bunch of white light, your brain just think, oh, it's high noon. Okay, wake the hell up. And that's not what you want, obviously. So sleep routine is very important. Using a sleep mask is very important. It just blacks out everything. You need things pitch black. And like, oh, yeah, no, I have it really dark. No, you don't. If you can see a silhouette of your hand, even vaguely in front of your face, it's too bright. And so like it needs to be just blackout, just nothing there, right? And so uh, that's what you, you need to do. And so, and you can try things like melatonin you know, over the counter and you can take that and it's, it's help reset your, your circadian rhythm, try to go to sleep at a, at a regular pat time. You know, don't go to sleep too late, all that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, all those things can hopefully help. And then try to think, you know, is there something that changed, you know, seven, eight months ago that, that may have influenced this as well? See if that, that brings about any ideas. Andrew, thank you for the super chat. One year ago on a standard American diet, um, male, six foot two, 260 pounds, A1C 5.6, HDL 40, LDL 85, triglycerides 196, now carnivore three months down to 230, A1C is 5.3, HDL is 39, LDL is 268, and triglycerides 126. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I mean, your weight, obviously, that's a that's a huge improvement. HDL didn't really change too much. I wouldn't worry about that. That will start to come up. Uh, and your triglycerides came down significantly, which is great. LDL, don't worry about it. Like it's just, it's just it's never a cause for heart disease in the first place. Um, you know, watch my video on the truth about cholesterol and heart disease. Watch all of um, talks by, you know, Dr. Paul Mason, things like that. It's just complete hoax. And, um, you know, people that have higher LDL live longer. People have higher total cholesterol live longer. So, you know, count your blessings. A1C coming up, uh, or no, sorry, a A1C came down as well. So all those things are great. All those things are fantastic. You know, the one thing, you have all those improvements, right? Your metabolic health um, and your weight and all these other sorts. I guarantee you there's a ton, a ton of other things that improved as well. You may have come off medications and other sorts of things as well. And, you know, you're going to see all those objective improvements on your blood. And everything's going the right direction. Your weight's going the right direction. You feel great. Your blood improvement, all this, and your LDL goes up. And you go, oh, shut it down. Go back to having diabetes and cancer. Like this is just no, no. This is just not worth it having that LDL up. Why? Um, you know, if everything's going in the right direction. Why are we saying that the LDL is going in the wrong direction? Everything else is going in the right direction. That's the trend. So why are we saying that that's the one thing that's swimming against the current? Why would that be? Uh, and and in fact, that's that's just an invention from the sugar companies, and I just don't I don't buy it. Um, so, no, I think that that's good, too. I think that's also uh, a move in the right direction. And um, and statistically, you're going to live longer. So congratulations. Uh, Mark Stevens, thank you for the super chat. I'm not seeing a question, but uh, maybe there's one further down. I'm just not seeing it. Uh, super chat from Lena. Alina, thank you very much. Uh, do you recommend doing bodybuilding competition on carnivore? Well, if you – well – if you're going to do a bodybuilding competition, I would, I would recommend it being on carnivore. Yeah, absolutely. Look up, uh, my friend, Richard Smith, he goes by keto pro. Um, it's really carnivore pro because that's what he does. Um, but, um, you know, he was, he was a professional bodybuilder. He sort of moved on to different, different avenues now, but, um, he was a, a natural, um, bodybuilder and he won like the European pro bodybuilding championship as a, as a natural athlete competing against, um, uh, performance enhanced, uh, athletes, right. The bodybuilders and he, and he won and he, I mean, he was able to get down to like 2% body fat. He's absolutely shredded. And so, um, you know, that's uh, yeah, you're going to be able to work out harder. You're going to be able to recover faster. You'll get more muscle gain, lean mass gain, uh, for your effort. And, uh, you won't have to like do this whole dirty bulk thing where you, gain a whole bunch of fat and then have to lose muscle and fat, you know, which is, 
you're not losing muscle and fat anyway. You're just losing fat. You're just um, you're losing glycogen, water weight, and then intramuscular fat out of your muscles. That's that's what they're losing anyway. They never gained the muscle in the first place. So no, it's much better. I mean, the golden era bodybuilders, they were just eating steak and eggs, steak and eggs, steak and eggs. Some of them thought you had to do one refeeding day on with some carbs one day a week to replenish your liver glycogen but that's not true you know we know now that that uh, your body replenishes your liver and muscle glycogen better when you don't eat carbs than when you do eat carbs so um and faster too so uh yes i would absolutely recommend that and more and more people are doing that now and having fantastic results so hopefully you do too so there's a um, question or comment from Andrew uh, who says, thank you, you saved my life. I started at 600 pounds with chronic pain, and although I'm still obese, I have a ton more mobility. I've been filming my whole journey, so I never forget where I started. Well, that's amazing, Andrew. That, thank you so much for sharing that. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, and I'm glad you're you're recording this. You know, I mean, that's, that's really, really important for people to see. Um, so if you have a, a YouTube channel, you know, feel free to, to pop it up and people can take a look at it. And, um, you know, so if you're, if you're filming it, but you haven't shared it on social media, please do please start a, a YouTube channel and, um, Instagram page and, and, and document your journey and, and show people this because that's really helpful for people to see, because there are a lot of people in your position right now that, uh, don't know where to go and, and their life is, is hopeless. And so they don't know what the hell to do. And so the more people that come out there and say, hey, look, this this actually works um, and you can you can do this and you can get better and you don't have to starve yourself or eat you know, rabbit food and make yourself feel miserable all the time and depressed. Um, you know, you can actually eat real food and uh, and get real results. And that's really the only way you're going to get real results is it with real food. So please do please do share that if you haven't already. And thank you very much uh, for for being here today. Uh, Sandra says, I don't understand vegan positions. Yeah, it's, it's really bad. And also, um, you know, why are you, why are you telling somebody, you know, to, uh, to go, to go vegan, you know, with, with, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not part of the treatment protocol. I mean, that there's certainly not, that's certainly not in the guidelines or anything else. And there's, there's no, uh, backing for that in the literature, you know, to say that, you know, you should go on a plant-based diet, that's going to help you recover from necrotizing fasciitis. Really? You know, I mean, the studies that have been done is showing that higher protein is what is what you need in these circumstances when you're healing tissue. So, you know, going on a, on a nutritionally deficient diet, like a, a, a vegan diet is, um, is, is asinine in that situation for a doctor to start recommending that. I mean, they are, they are doing harm to their patients and that is, uh, obviously very much against the, the code of ethics for doctors. And so I hope they, they, uh, they, you know, pull it around because that's, uh, they're, they're harming a lot of people doing that. Uh, Terry Goki from Facebook says started yesterday. Other than headaches, I'm all, I'm doing good. And you'll check up in three weeks trying to get out of uh, pre-diabetic category. Well, I, look, I think you'll uh, I think you'll do well. It, it may not be that you'll reverse your pre-diabetes in just three weeks, but it'll it should make a, a significant dent in it. Um, but if it doesn't, if it's not as dramatic a change as you as you were hoping for in three weeks, just give it time. It will go away. Um, this has been clinically proven at, from Verda Health and uh, elsewhere that you uh, go into a high fat um, meat-based ketogenic diet, it reverses type two diabetes. So, you know, you're going on carnivore diet, it's going to be even better when you're just getting rid of absolutely everything your body doesn't need or want. And, uh, only things that it, that does need and want. And, uh, and you'll do very, very well. Your diabetes, pre-diabetes will be, will, will go away. Uh, don't worry about that. Get adequate sleep, de-stress, keep your life happy and meaningful and, um, and you'll do fine. Mary Shepard, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, any vitamin uh, may help with alcohol detox. My doctor um, prescribed naltrexone and um, vitamin B1 for 30 days only. Beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. My vice with beer, I feel I'm ready to kick. Um, uh, kick it and detox. So, um you know, B vitamins are very good. I mean, the B1 is thiamine. That's, um, that's typical for people because you sort of alcohol will give you 
B vitamin deficiencies in general, but uh, certainly thiamine def deficiencies. And so that's usually what we, we would give people in the hospital when they're sort of detoxing or, um, you know, very sick with, with uh, alcoholism. Um, yeah, sure. Naltrexone can potentially help with with um, cravings and things like that. But just ketogenic diets in general have actually been shown to improve um, from alcohol detox and withdrawals. And uh, in clinical trials in humans, they found that not only did they subjectively report not feeling as, as uh, many effects from the withdrawal and not feeling as many cravings, not feeling that they needed to drink as much, um, they found that objectively they needed less medications to keep them out of the DTs. So there you go. Um, you're, you're doing, you're doing everything that you need to. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else as far as the detox is concerned, you know, like glutathione is, is, is helpful to get the nasty, nasty things out of your body that, um, that, uh, alcohol can make as a metabolite. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not on the alcohol, that's not really, that, that's sort of helping the hangover as opposed to uh, just detoxing. So um, just do what you do. And um, if you're ready mentally, then, then you'll do great. Once you get this stuff out of your system for a couple of weeks, um, you know, you'll feel so much better. Two, three weeks, 30 days, you're going to feel fantastic. And um, you're going to feel so, so much better that you've got the alcohol out that, that hopefully that's enough to say, yeah, I don't want this stuff in my body. This stuff is poison. So good luck to that. Metalhead Hippie, thank you for the super chat. Is iodine, is iodine okay to take just as a supplement or do you need to be deficient in it? Any chance of saving a gallbladder, healing it uh, if you have stones? Thank you. Um, yeah, you can save your gallbladder. It depends on how bad the stones are. If it's if they're just super big, you know, they, there's a chance that these things can get stuck. Maybe they can dissolve enough. I don't know. We don't have any evidence one way or the other with that. Um, but uh, if the stones are small enough, they can just pass through potentially. And there are people that have had stones and gone carnivore and uh, you know cleared up their issues and haven't had any sort of um, negative reaction from that. If the stones are too big, they can get caught and you'll need uh, you know surgical intervention to get that sucker taken out. You either down through the mouth and just pull it out of the tube if it's stuck in the tube. Uh, in the bile ducts or um, could potentially need to get the gallbladder removed, you know, but if you don't eat, you know, fatty meat, then it's definitely going to grow and they're definitely going to get stuck and you're definitely going to need to get it taken out. That's just all there is to it. So when you start eating more fat, then you're going to start moving these things out and you're going to stop building up the stones. That's, that's how that, that works. Um, as far as uh, iodine as a supplement, yeah, you can. I mean, a lot of people can be deficient in it. I don't feel the need to take supplements unless you are deficient in something. Um, depending on where you're sourcing your meat and and you know the micro specific micronutrients in it, it may be that it doesn't have all that much iodine in it. But um, if that's the case and you're a bit deficient, then sure, supplementing. I think it's just it's just important to be a bit careful because if people are having thyroid issues, you want to know why you're having a thyroid issue. Is it because you're not, if you're deficient in iodine or is it because you have Hashimoto's? Hashimoto's thyroiditis is, is one of the most common uh, autoimmune diseases already and it's wildly underdiagnosed because no one looks for it until it's, it's an absolute train wreck disaster. Um, but I look at things when it's more subtle and I find way more cases than you would imagine. And, um, and so that's just something good to know. And so if you have Hashimoto's, that can really exacerbate uh, the Hashimoto's if you take iodine for some damn reason. And so you can just make that worse and make your antibodies jump up and, and, um, be a bit worse. So, um, why is that? Is it, uh, because of the supplement itself or just having, a lot more iodine than you necessarily need somehow triggers this off. Is there something else that's going on with it? We don't know. Um, also, we only know this in the context of, of eating a standard diet because that's, that's what everybody does. And so maybe it's only, it's only those people, maybe on a carnivore diet, it doesn't exacerbate Hashimoto's, but that is the accepted uh, teaching at the moment is that I, you know, taking iodine when you have Hashimoto's actually makes it worse. So, uh, uh, try not to do that unless you are aware of your Hashimoto status. I think it's just safer to, to just check that and just see where you're at. And if you have antibodies, antibodies for Hashimoto's, then probably don't take 
the iodine unless you are strictly deficient. Question from uh, Karen Richter Visor. Thank you for, or yeah, from from um, Facebook. I'm on day 52, mostly for joint pain, but also for weight loss. Lost four kilos in the first four weeks, but have stalled now. Feeling good though. Well, really, the main thing is just is just feeling good. So just focus on your on your health and how you're feeling and your energy levels and joint pain and all that sort of stuff, and um, you know, and just and just go from there. If you are, if you're feeling good, that's the most important thing. You know, there's different, different reasons that you wait and stall. I, I don't think it's a great idea to check your weight in general because, you know, bone has weight, muscle has weight, you're improving your lean mass. You're also going to increase your weight and that can offset the fat you're losing. And so all of a sudden you're stalling, but are you stalling? You're, you could still be losing fat and, uh, and not losing weight. So that's an important, uh, important distinction and, and, uh, something to think about. Mostly just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Uh, exercise when and where you can. Go for walks and, uh, you know, do resistance exercises. Um, it could be just body weight. It could be at the gym. And try to go sprinting. That's a fantastic exercise. When you are exercising, you will put on muscle. You will put on bone. You will put on weight. and um, But you also lose fat. And so you, you need to remember that that's going to offset. Um offset all of that as well. Let me see here. I'm just going to just check one thing. How are we doing on time? Oh, no. Um, okay. Um, why don't we say no more super chats at this point? Um, so that, uh, yeah, so I'll probably need to, to go uh, around noon ish. So um, maybe we'll just do what's left and then and then call it a day. Um, and Banesh, thank you very much for the super sticker. It's very kind of you. Um, Ryan, thank you for the super chat. Do you know who Greg Judy is? Uh, he'd be a great person to have an interview. with. <laughs> um, it wasn't Greg Judy from um, um, God, what was it? The TV show with um, uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. Isn't that who Greg Judy was? He was like the, the car thief. He was like that. It was just like that. He was a hilarious character. Um, Doug Judy. That's who it was. Doug Judy. Greg Judy. No, I don't. <laughs> Greg Judy is apparently. Um, I'll take. I'll take a look. Um, I'll, I'll note it down though, and I'll look him up and um, and see. Uh, yeah, Doug Judy. Doug Judy would be a great guest to have on too. Maybe he's doing carnivore. We'll see. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this replay of my YouTube live. If you'd like to catch a live version and ask your own questions, please go to the next scheduled one, usually every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, see you then, and please enjoy the rest of the Q&A. So Jason Brown, thank you very much for the super chat. Thoughts on Dr. McDougall's The Starch Solution. He's effectively treated thousands of diseases using a starch-based diet with positive results. Um, I don't, I don't actually know if I've seen that, um, you know, it depends on what, what else you're, you're cutting out. I mean, there were, was McDougal the one that did like the rice diet where it was just like white rice and that that's all people ate and they, they lost weight and they reversed different issues. But I mean, uh, those sorts of things, at least that one, I mean, it's not sustainable. And you, you talk to people that were sort of involved in those studies and like, it's completely unsustainable. People hated it. They were miserable. Um, and, um, they weren't able to sort of continue this stuff at, at home and um uh and so they they just all fell off of it as soon as they left um so yeah it's uh it, it's hard to say but you know what else are you cutting out you know that's that's one of the things that a friend of mine dr uh uh chris kenobi said um he, he argues a lot that that seed oils are really the big culprit here um and i would say you know seed oils and fructose are very very major culprits um and and he, he used if it wasn't McDougal's, it was whoever did the rice diet, um, and um, and he was showing that this was uh, at least in that study. I don't know if it's been replicated because that's important. Is it uh, replicable? Um, that at least in their study, it um, you know reverse diabetes and type two diabetes and you know help even though it was a very high carb diet, really like when they're just eating just a buttload of white rice. Um, you know they were. I mean, you can't, I mean, there's no nutrients in that though. I mean, you can't, you can't live like that. 
you know, so like, uh, but, but a lot of these things, it's just like, one of the things is just, you're cutting out a lot of things that are causing a lot of harm. So he thought that it was largely to do with, uh, cutting out, uh, seed oils, you know, and there's a lot of these different places that cut out seed oils and they have a lot less disease and, um, and, or no disease. And, um, but you know, in the rice diet too, you know, starch as well, you're cutting out fructose, you know, fructose is, is, uh, from the looks of it, pretty harmful stuff. And so, um, you know, that's, uh, that's the question, you know, you're, you're cutting out, you know, what is he cutting out as well? And is that what's causing the benefit? I mean, there's more than one ways to more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, but what's the most optimal way? What's the best way? What are we biologically optimized for, uh, in doing that? It's, uh, it's not from starch anyway. Um, but you know, you can, you can get good results by, you know, people go, you know, uh, more whole food plant-based and they reverse a lot of their issues because you're cutting out so much garbage that is, that is a major factor in causing harm. But then there's literally the most rigorously studied diet on this planet is a high fat meat based ketogenic diet, right? So a carnivore diet with a side salad, that's the most beneficial diet that's ever been studied. It's the only study that diet has been studied at such a high level with rigorous interventional trials, randomized controlled trials, and, uh, and showing massive improvements, massive benefits for multiple health outcomes like diabetes, like cancer, like autoimmunity, like Alzheimer's and on and on and on and on. Um, so, you know, getting rid of carbs and eating a lot more meat and cutting out all this stuff seems to do good. Eating more starchy food, but cutting out all this other crap, relatively going to be good. It's always compared to what, right? And so uh, compared to a carnivore diet, I doubt it. You know, I doubt that he's going to do better than a carnivore diet. You know, I have people that do very clean plant-based diet or very clean omnivorous diets, and they they get, they still get very sick and they have very serious autoimmunity. Um, and then they cut out the plants, all go away, right? And, um, you know, Inuit um, descent uh, people, First Nation up in Canada, one lady, she's been eating carnivore her whole life. That's a cultural thing, and her daughter just could not have any plants because she gets seizures. You get very unwell as a kid. And, um, and so they just ate meat for the you know, last 40 plus years, but she had, and you know, she's like 60 years old and she looks like she's 35 and maybe, and, um, and, but she was eating spices and she had a lot of seasonings and spices on the meat, but otherwise just meat. And she had four autoimmune diseases. It wasn't until she cut out the spices that those autoimmune diseases went away. So it just depends on the person, depends on the problem, and depends on what you're comparing it to. So the star solution as compared to a standard American diet, sure. You know, there's probably gonna be a lot of objective benefits to doing that. Is that gonna be the best thing that you can do though? That's the question. Is it gonna be better than eating our naturally evolved diet? That's the question. Improving someone's diet is going to improve their health, 100%. Get rid of processed food, get rid of that crap, um, get rid of the seed oils, get rid of the sugars, and uh, all that sort of stuff definitely going to help. Um, is that the only thing that's going to help? No. Is that the best thing? Is it going to help the most? That's the question. And so um, that's that's uh, you know what I would argue is a more important question to ask is uh, what's the best diet that we can possibly do? What's the optimal thing for humans to do? And I don't think it includes starch. Carnivore Nurse Kim, thank you very much for the super chat. On keto, I got calf cramps, not on carnivore. Does this make sense? And do you know the reason? Um, you know, I mean, there there can be differences in, in electrolytes and things like that that can give you leg cramps, you know, different anti-nutrients in keto that can strip out magnesium and other sorts of electrolytes and, and calcium and things like that. You can get cramps. Um, quite often it's, it's dehydration, you know, so it's, you know, not getting enough water. You know, if you have a lot of fiber, that's going to, you know, move your bowels more quickly. You're not going to desiccate and dehydrate your, your stool as much. And so you're not going to retain as much water as you can get maybe possibly a bit dehydrated on that. Um, so it could be to do with that as well. You know, it could be that you're just, you're retaining a bit more water. And so even though you're not necessarily drinking more water, or maybe you are drinking more water, you're, you're, you have more water in your body anyway. Um, so, um, those are, those are some possible explanations anyway, but, um, either way they're gone, which is, which is the good thing. And if you get them again, 
I would think water first as opposed to electrolytes. Almost always, it's uh, not enough water, almost always. And some people, when they take a lot of salt, a lot of electrolytes, you actually increase your body's demand for water and you give yourself a, a relative dehydration. There's that thing, relative again, it's always compared to what, right? And so um, when you're eating a ton of, ton of electrolytes and taking a lot of these supplements, then you need uh, a higher, you'll have a higher demand for water. So great. That's awesome. And, and sometimes when people go keto, they, oh, you have to have a whole bunch of electrolytes. Maybe you stopped those when you went carnivore as well. Who knows? But uh, those are some those are some possible explanations anyway. But either way, I'm glad they're gone. Basic X, thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, Anthony, love what you do. Uh, one thing bugs me. You advocate natural and evolutionary appropriate diet. Are you on HRT? If so, not important to share. Uh, no, I am not on HRT. Uh, in fact, I have never put anyone on um, TRT, like uh, testosterone replacement or, you know, women going through menopause and they they want to go on that sort of stuff. Um, I've inherited a lot of patients that have uh, been on HRT or, or testosterone replacement therapy. Um, I have not put anybody on them. I always ask them to try a carnivore diet first. And for my patients, the male patients, they all improve their testosterone. And I, like I said, I had a 72 year old patient who, um, you know, slammed up his test, like literally tripled his testosterone levels went from, these are Australian numbers. So a typical, um, you know, a good range for, um, someone who in their mid twenties, a man in their mid twenties, uh, you know, in good health, their testosterone level would be, be between 600 and 900 for Australian numbers. And his was, you know, it was like 200, 220 or something like that. So quite low and, but you know, it's 72. So like, yeah, well, that's just what it is. And so, you know, some doctors would say, okay, well, you're symptomatic. We'll put you on testosterone if you want it. And I just said, Hey, why don't you try this instead? And he went on it and he, um, like in three months, three or four months, he went from like 220 up to like 750. Right. So he like over tripled his testosterone. He's out there in the middle of the range that you'd expect a healthy 25 year old to be. And he's 72. And when he came in there, he said, he's like, I feel like a teenager. I just tons of energy. All I want to do is work out and have sex with my wife. I just like this kid again, um, which is great. Maybe not. <laughs> I tell that to, to um, older women. They're like, oh, not good for the wife. You know, <laughs> they looked horrified by it. But, you know, if she's doing it, too. Maybe that that, um, you know, made her happier about it as well. Um, but no, I get people off of TRT. I don't put them on it. Um, most patients that I have that have inherited, uh, who are on testosterone replacement therapy, I try to talk them into going on a carnivore diet to improve their hormones. And quite often you'll see their testosterone, same dose, their testosterone levels just creeping up and up and up and up and up and up and DHEA creeping up and up and up and up and up. And you're like, okay, well, let's start ratcheting it down, ratcheting it down, ratcheting it down. And a lot of times you can take them off. And uh, that's what I've been able to do. And some people just feel so good. They they just, they say, well, do I have to be on this stuff? I'm like, no, of course not. You know, if you feel good and you want to try this on your own, just come right off. And so one guy um, actually seen that the testosterone replacement was actually suppressing his body's ability to make make enough. And it was actually slowing him down because he'd been on carnivore for six months. He said he felt amazing. He wanted to try to come off. So I said, okay, great. Well, let's take you off and check you again in two months and see where you're at. His testosterone, again, Australian numbers was 450. So, you know, even with TRT, it wasn't even in that 25 year old range. And then when he came off of it, two months later, it was 650. So it jumped up 200 points by stopping the testosterone replacement. So no, uh, no, you don't need to take that stuff. And I don't recommend it to people uh, when they're starting this. When I have, when I see people and they, they come in and their testosterone is low, I said, okay, well, look, we need two data points. You know, uh, we can't just, I mean, this could be an off test. It could just be that, you know, how it was taken or it could be a lab error. You know, we need to check this again. In that time, you go on this diet and here are all the reasons why you do. We check it again, it's double or triple what it was, job done. You know, you don't need to put them on anymore. And so, uh, no, my, um, you know, my approach is to do this naturally for people and not put them on that. And that includes myself. Tyler, a wise guy. Thank you for the super chat. 
do you know if the diet, carnivore diet can cause high heart rate for the first month? Um, it, you know, I, I've spoken to people and it's, and it has caused an increase in their heart rate. So it's just gone up a bit, typically not over 100. So maybe it's like the, the, the people that you know track this stuff pretty regularly is like, well, it's normally like in the sixties or, and now it's in the eighties or now it's in the nineties or something like that. Uh, so it's up for them, but it's not necessarily like, like, you know, clinical tachycardia. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, um, that you can see, but I don't, I don't think that's a big deal. You know, when your heart actually optimally runs on ketones as well, uh, as your brain, right? So it's, um, when you start going on ketones, all of a sudden your heart starts beating better. So maybe that increases the rate a bit. Oftentimes people just feel a stronger heartbeat that they can hear in their ears. And that I think is probably because of the ketones. Just your, your heart's running on ketones, you're just going boom, boom, boom. That's a big, strong heartbeat. You get used to that. You know, your heart, your heart gets used to running on rocket fuel now when before it was on crude oil. Um, and so it's, uh, it's now just working a lot better. And then it just sort of adjusts, you know, it's now it's using this really good, uh, efficient fuel and it doesn't need to, um, you know, it can sort of slow down this, these comp compensatory, um, processes that it may have gone through in order to, uh, get the, get the job done with what you were giving it before, which was glucose. Um, if you're getting a heart rate over 100, you should get that checked out. You should get a like an ECG, EKG, and um, you know get it checked out to make sure that it's not something abnormal. A carnivore diet won't cause that, but something else can cause that, and maybe this can unmask something else that's underlying, um, or you know it could be you know a coincidence that something comes up at that time. Um, caffeine can increase your heart rate. All these sorts of things as well so keep that in mind and you can be much more sensitive to um much more sensitive to caffeine as well um uh, when you go on a carnivore diet also so yeah you know and, and if you but if it's a regular pattern regular rhythm regular uh, rate as in under 100 even if it's a bit higher for you i wouldn't worry too much about it if it's an irregular pattern ir irregular rhythm and and over an irregular rate, so over 100 or under 60, best to get that checked out, and just to you know just to have that peace of mind that everything's okay, or if there's something else going on, you sort of investigate. Here's potassium high or low. Um, almost never will be. I've never never seen that. Um, I've seen one guy have a low potassium, but it wasn't even all that low. It wasn't symptomatic or anything like that. So I just said just check check it again and uh, and see what that is. It could just be you know, a, a, a lab error. Sure enough, it was, um, you know, it was dead in the middle of the normal range. So, you know, on a repeat test, you know, a few days later. So, you know, I, it's not something that you typically see people get derangement of their potassium, which could give you an ir uh, irregularity like atrial fibrillation. But generally atrial fibrillation is not only a fast beat, it's an irregular beat. It's irregularly irregular. There's no pattern to it. It's just this wild random uh set of beats so you know if you're getting something like that certainly get it checked out and um you know check your potassium and things like that so uh yeah but no typically it won't cause tachycardia it shouldn't cause tachycardia anyway but if it's uh if you are tachycardic do get that checked out because there could be something else underlying dr good thank you for the super chat uh can ketone supplements be useful on days where you don't eat enough fat can these stall weight loss i have a hard time eating enough fat any suggestions um you know just just work on it you know you'll you'll get more used to eating fat i know it's it's hard for some people because you just you know we're, we've been told our whole life don't eat fat it's going to kill you um so you just have to sort of recondition yourself if you want to take ketones if you feel that they can help you then that's that's fine. I wouldn't take anything with any uh, artificial sweeteners or flavorings, which means it's going to taste disgusting. And so, you know, it's, I, I, I wouldn't envy you for, for taking those. Even the ones with stevia, I've tried it once with stevia and it was abhorrent. I, it's just like, it's nothing that I wanted to ever do again. And I didn't feel any different. You know, I didn't, I didn't feel that this gave me a big boost. You know, my brain was already running on ketones and my body was making it up. You, know, you have you have fat stores unless you're extremely emaciated 
Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, but uh, your body can still make ketones. Um, if you want to try it and it makes you feel better, you know, fine if that's what you want to do. But uh, I think you'll, you'll be fine anyway. Just try to slowly increase the amount of fat, add fat in when and where you can in order to increase the amount of fat that you have. And you'll, you, you know, scramble eggs with a lot of butter. It can taste very good and you don't notice it as much. Um, things like that. And just having more marbled meat that has, has a better fat content that you don't really see as much, cutting off a slice of fat, putting it on a leaner piece of meat, eating those together, those sorts of things. And eventually you'll you'll um, you'll increase your body's uh, desire and uh, an expectation for fat and an ability to you know take it down without without making yourself feel a bit um, unhealthy. Um, I don't think that they'll stall. I don't think ketone supplements will call, stall weight loss, though, but I don't know one way or the other. Artificial sweeteners definitely can stall weight loss, and I would avoid those for that reason. Uh, well, actually, for a lot of reasons, but that being one of them. Um, but, I mean, things like stevia in, in animal studies in mice, they found that the equivalent of one diet soda equivalent of stevia was enough to reduce the the fertility rates in mice by 55%. So it's like, why would you want that in your body? Well, it doesn't have calories. Like, great, now there's arsenic. You know, good luck with that. So, it's um, it's something that I would I would definitely avoid. Uh, Tulsi's next to X. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Carnivore, but still drinking zero call carb seltzers four to six daily. Can this be more damaging than doing this on a regular diet? Digestion issues remain. Carnivore. Uh, with weekly cheats for five months. Uh, thanks for being altruistic. Well, you're, you're very welcome. Uh, hopefully this has helped you. I mean, just eating a lot more meat, a lot more fat, not being afraid of the fat is going to help you a lot and cutting out and being consciously conscious about the other things you're eating and, and reducing them significantly is, is definitely going to be a lot better for you. So uh, that's great. Hopefully you've seen a lot of, of help with that. Um, you know, the weekly cheats are going to keep you addicted to things. Um, they're going to make you keep missing those things. And you're going to, and by the time you get used to it and, and you sort of are getting these out of your system, it's time to, to re up and get yourself addicted again. So, you know, maybe try 30 days just cutting out everything. You'll probably feel a lot better and you probably won't even want to go back uh, to doing the cheat. So just, you know, have a think about that, but yeah. So the zero carb seltzers, you know, well, what's zero carb about it? Is it because it's just seltzer water or is it because it has artificial sweeteners? If it has artificial sweeteners, then, uh, yeah, that can be, that can be harmful and it can cause your digestion issues or, or, you know, uh, at least contribute to them. And, uh, and this is it because all these artificial sweeteners, especially, you know, East stevia, monk fruit, sugar, erythritol, xylitol, um, and, uh, sorbitol and xylose and all that, all these nasty things, they cause diarrhea. I mean, they're, they're laxatives and they will absolutely screw up your digestion. So you don't want to do that. Is it more damaging than if you were eating this crap while eating more crap? No, you're eating less crap. And so that's beneficial. So you are, you are doing better, but it's can absolutely contribute to a lot of your problems like the digestion issues. And so I would, I would you know, strongly recommend, you know, trying to get off these things for 30 days, it's 30 days. You know, Jordan Peterson said, you can, you can hang out of a windowsill by your fingertips for 30 days in the grand scheme of your life. This is going to completely change and revolutionize your health for the rest of your life and make you live longer. You can do anything for 30 days. And that's in that, um, in that situation. So, uh, give it a try. See how you feel. I, I would bet that you're going to feel a lot better. Preston Meyer, thank you for the super chat. This will be the, the last question, everyone. We've gotten down to the last of the super chat. So I want to thank everybody uh, for coming on. Thanks, everyone, for all the super chats. Very kind of you. And I do try to answer other questions, too, but obviously I have to prioritize the, the super chats. Um, so thank you again, everyone, um, for that. So Preston says, hey, Doc. Almost finished with day one carnivore, doing it to put my bipolar into remission. I'm 24, six foot three, 195 pounds, exercise five days a week. My meds are 50 milligrams of Seroquel, 1,000 milligrams of uh, Depakote. Uh, any advice 
for labs for or getting off of them with carnivore. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to do any particular labs. Um, I just think you're doing great. I think it's really great that you are giving this a try and, um, you know, seeing what other people are doing. I mean, this has been, you know, shown by, you know, Professor um, Chris Palmer, and Professor Georgia Ead over at Harvard to be very beneficial to bipolar and other mental health issues. So, um, but it's certainly not accepted mainstream yet uh, because it's not even known about mainstream yet. And so I'm really glad that you were, you're brave enough to give this a try and try to help your situation. And I really hope it works for you. And I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will help significantly. And hopefully it gets rid of it altogether. Um, really the main thing to do is the diet, right? So just high fat meat, just water, that's it really cut out everything else except your your meds. Um, if you need to be on meds, you need to be on meds. Um, I, I can't uh, help you with sort of how to get off those things. It's just going to be when you're feeling stable enough and you're not having uh, uh, the issues that you, you would normally have with bipolar syndrome, um, bipolar disorder, then you start thinking about, okay, you know, do I need to be on these medications anymore? And be stable for, you know, a couple of months before you start thinking about this and then talk to your doctor and say, Hey, look, I'm feeling great. I've cleaned up my diet. I'm exercising. I feel really good. I'd like to try coming off these things. Can you help me with that? These things often need to be reduced very slowly and carefully under the supervision of your doctor. And so that's, that's the way you would do it. Um, Exercise is great, especially anaerobic exercise. So lifting weights, doing sprints, those sorts of things. You know, you want to you know walk and skip straight to sprinting from walking if you can. Um, and so you know, but that high intensity exercise is really important. It's really helpful to your brain health and your body. It actually increases brain derived neurotropic factor (BDNF), and that can help uh, restructure your brain and make more synaptic um, connections and improve. Uh, as well. As you go, the mitochondria in your brain and the rest of your body will not only improve in function and character, but in number. So after three, four months, you should have four times the number of mitochondria and they'll be four times as effective, which would make a massive, massive improvement to both your mental health and your physical health. Um, as far as labs are concerned, you know, I think the some of them may be just academic, you know, you check your testosterone levels, you sort of check and see what, you know, your, your normal hormones are doing just like your testosterone and things like that. Um, you could check your thyroid. Sometimes people are having a low thyroid that can contribute to mental health issues. Um, these should improve, but if you're very low on like thyroid side of things, you know, it may be that you're low enough and you have a, have a significant problem that you know, maybe um, some thyroid medication actually would help with your with your uh, recovery and your mental health issues. But I think the most important things would be things like B12 and vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, those sorts of things. And uh, just understand that the reference ranges that we use as doctors or in the labs are the average for the community. They're not the reference ranges for good health or optimal health. Most doctors don't know that. And so you go to your doctor and everything's, all the numbers are black. They say, you're fine. Everything's in normal. No, you're not fine. <laughs> not necessarily. So for B12, for instance, I have yet to see a single reference range anywhere in the world that actually includes even part of what I would consider an optimal reference range for B12. So almost everybody's going to be deficient in B12 um, at, at this point. Most people are deficient in B12. And that's why the average range shows deficiency because most people are deficient. And so that's what you're seeing. The reference range is, hey, yeah, you're right in the reference range. Right. So I'm deficient. That's what that's saying. So if you're normal for B12, you're deficient. That's that's a good rule of thumb. So in America, uh, an optimal range would be around 1,100 to 1,600 for most people, right? And then in Australia, New Zealand, uh, UK, and probably Canada because it's, it's a commonwealth is um, 800 to 1,200. And below 400 in those countries is, is, is a severe deficiency where you can get demyelination of your nerves, your axons of your nerve cells, right? You get brain damage, nerve damage. In America, it's under um, 540 is, I believe, the conversion. So that's a critical deficiency. So if you're in that critical deficiency, get a shot. 
You know, that's that's not something you want to sit on. Um, and then you at least know, you know, adding in a bit of liver, a bit of kidney and, and other organs, you know, that can that can help catch you up. Because when we start a carnivore diet, most everyone is deficient in a lot of nutrients. And um, vitamin D is a hormone. It's very important for your brain and your nervous system as well. And so, you know, if you don't have enough of this, and most people don't, um, you know, this can this can cause problems, right? You're going to get this from meat. You're going to get this from animal fat, especially good quality animal fat. Um, it doesn't have to be grass fed and finished, but that is better fat. That is a better nutrient profile. If you can't afford it, you can't have access to it. Don't worry about it. Eat the best quality meat that you can, uh, that you can afford, that you have access to, that tastes good, makes you feel good. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes just add in, you know, a bit of liver if you want to, because that can be very nutrient dense. You don't always have to. Most people will get enough nutrients just from, you know, Safeway beef, right? Or, or Tesco beef or Coles beef, depending on what country you're in. And um, so if you, um, if you're just eating, you know, just beef and eggs and all these sorts of things, you're going to be, you're going to be massively improving your nutrients and you'll catch up eventually. It just may take a little longer than if you add in a bit of organs early on. It's pasture raised eggs instead of normal eggs are twice the price, but they've got 20 times the folate and other sort of micronutrients are improved as well. So it's uh, it's more bang for your buck anyway. And so uh, something to think about, you know, just maybe like that's, that's what I would check is if you have very severe deficiencies, you know, like, like B12 in that critical range, probably good to get a shot, you know, of, of uh, methyl cobalamin, which is the methylated form of B12, which is the one you want. And um, if you can't get a shot, then, you know, the under the tongue ones, hopefully without sugar or sweeteners in it, um, you need to catch that up. You need to get those levels out of those critical ranges because those critical deficient, those critical ranges can cause deficiency that can actually cause neurological damage and damage to your body and your brain. Um, can be reversible, but you can also get, you know, serious damage and it can take a long time to reverse or maybe not even reverse. So, you know, that's what I would suggest. Otherwise, just eat meat, uh, eat fatty meat, be happy, cut out everything else, and then be very careful about coming off your medications. Do that with the doctor's supervision and only when you're ready for it. Okay. Good luck with that, Preston. I'm really glad to see that you're you're going to give this a try. Let me know uh, when you're yeah you know, when you're uh, you know sort of a few months on it with it, and let me know how you're going because it's uh, it's something that everyone can uh, be helped with. You know, it's really important for people to know how people are doing. Um, thank you all, everyone, uh, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, do remember that uh, the Regenerate Health Summit is coming up um, this month. Um, ooh, just in a couple of weeks, actually. So it's on April 21st, which is a Sunday. And um, you can go to regenerateaus.com. Um, and um, uh, and for, for tickets there, I believe there are some tickets left, but um, they are uh, they are running out. So if you if anyone's going to be in the Melbourne area that weekend or wants to come down, um, that's where we'll be. And um, Dr. Pran Yoga Nathan will be there. Um, as well as uh, Max Colhane, Dr. Max Colhane, and um, um, and uh, Mr. Arnett from uh, you know Arnett crackers and and biscuits and things like that. And he's going to be talking about regenerative farming. And um, and I am and and I think Jalal will be there as well. He was a speaker last time, and I'm I'm pretty sure he's going to be there this time as well. But anyway, it's going to be a great lineup. I'm going to be going on. Uh, a lot of rants about my feelings on the, on the healthcare system and and why it's so screwed up and how we can fix it. Um, and so if people want to see that, they they can see me there. And then uh, on the PHC, uh, Public Health Collaboration in the UK, that's another conference that's going to be in London next month in May. So that'll be um, in London, May 18th to the 20th. And you can see the link down there as well. It's uh, phcuk.org. Uh, and um, we can see that there. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Um, it's great to see everybody there. Please do comment below. You know, we talked about, you know, different people with, um, you know, coming from a plant-based diet and coming, um, you know, to this way of eating. If that was you, why'd you do it? And and what were your benefits? What were, what were the different things 
that you saw from that. I think it's really important that we know about this, you know, because there are very good people that are that are being duped into doing what they think is the right thing and with absolutely the right motivations and um, and they're being preyed upon. And so I think that it's important for for people that have gone through that and and come around the other side to talk about that and um, you know comment and let people know how uh, their experiences went and how they're doing now. And uh, so if you could, please do leave a comment below and let people know your thoughts on that and your experiences as well, uh, because I think it's, it's very important uh, for people to know about. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. I will see you in two days for my uh, next live event, Friday morning for me, Thursday night in America. Thank you all very much. I'll see you soon. And I'll have a premiere tomorrow morning, sort of the same-ish time, um, maybe a bit earlier. But anyway, so uh, anyway, it will be tomorrow, roughly the same time, have my next premiere for uh, YouTube. Um, my YouTube uh, uh, video new release will be tomorrow um, around the same start time, probably 9 a.m., maybe 8, 9 a.m. And um, great. All right. We'll see you all then. And um, until next time, take care.